Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day one of the 34th annual California Small Farm Conference. Um, I'm really excited to be kicking off this year's conference uh, with today's workshop. Um, if you're looking for uh, the Grazer's Toolbox, you're in the right place. Um, we've got some really terrific uh, speakers today uh, and a super important topic. So um, really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, my name is Evan Wig. I'm with uh, Community Alliance with Family Farmers. And uh, I just want to give a, a big thanks to today's speakers, um, everyone who helped organize the conference, and of course, our sponsors who make this uh, whole event possible. Uh, and to all of you for showing up here and, and uh, continuing to, to learn and grow and um, advocate for uh, small farms and local food. Um, want to just do a quick reminder, let everybody know that today's uh, workshop is being recorded and will be posted online later. Uh, not the breakout groups or anything like that, um, but uh, the main uh, the main presentation will. Um, and without uh, further ado, um, oh, last thing I want to let you guys know is that at the uh, there will be an, an evaluation that will be going out. You'll see that in an email. We'll be sending that out to all uh, people who registered. Um, so if you see that, please take a moment, just let us know how you, you, you feel about the, the workshop, the conference overall, if you have any great uh, insights or ideas, we want to hear it. Um, so without further ado, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I want to pass it on now to Olivia and Cole, um, who are going to be uh, your pre present present presenters today, and uh, they got a lot to share. Um, really wonderful people, and I can't wait to uh, hear what they have to say. So um, take it away. Thanks, Evan. Uh, my name is Olivia, and I'm super excited to be here with my partner in crime, Cole. This is actually officially our very first presentation together, although I feel like we've sort of built a life together. So thanks you all for waking up early on a Sunday morning and we're excited to kick off the conference. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just get rolling. And Evan, let us know if anything gets funky. And Cole, I'm gonna pass you the baton too for when we need it. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. So, who are we? Um, I am a independent consultant and educator. I work with independent farms and ranches. I also work with nonprofit organizations and service providers. I mostly teach business and strategy and financials, all of the sexy back end of what makes your farm or ranch operation tick. I have a long uh, history in entrepreneurial endeavors in farming and food service establishments and food businesses myself. And then I accidentally tumbled into being a consultant. Um, Cole, you wanna say something about yourself? Sure, good morning, everybody. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, on the West Coast. So I'm, I'm stoked you all made it. My name is Brittany Cole Bush. Friends call me Cole. Feel free to call me Cole. I am the owner operator of Shepherdess Land and Livestock Company and Shepherdess Holistic Hides. Shepherdess uh, Land and Livestock is a targeted grazing business in Southern California. And I am dedicated to supporting a next generation of shepherds and entrepreneurs in this awesome work using sheep and goats and managed grazing to address all of the incredible opportunity to address a lot of the issues that we have in uh, all over the West and small ruminants are my thing. I also have a small business called Shepherdess Holistic Hides using a byproduct working with farmers and ranchers uh, in all over the West to um, take the byproduct of uh, sheep hides that come from um, the lamb and goat industry and we tan them and we um, create a beautiful added value product of sheepskins. So I'm excited to share with you a project that Olivia and I have been working on to support folks like you. Thanks, Cole. So the way we got here is actually through a project that was started by Fibershed um, and my work with Fibershed. For those of you who don't know, Fibershed is an organization in Northern California working to support everybody inside of the fiber economy and also working essentially on climate, climate mitigation issues within the world of um, at every step of the supply chain in the fiber world. Um, and that project gave rise to uh, something that we call the Grazing Toolbox. I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. This is also a project of the Grazing School of the West, which is Cole and I's um, 
side hustle, let's say, in bringing education into the world of grazing in a way that is fairly amorphous and takes many shapes, including speaking and workshops um, and things like toolboxes. So why are we here today? Uh, you know, essentially, oh, Coley, this is you. Why don't you talk about this? This is your world. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of jumped in in my introduction. So targeted grazing and the industry of the vocational grazer is an awesome ancient, what we call ancient futures, looking at um, an, an ancient practice of pastoralism and working with um, ruminants of all kinds. We're taking those simple ecological processes of the sheep and goats, and we're using them in a targeted way to address uh, things like wild. Oh, this industry is just absolutely booming because it's a it's a it's a climate a beneficial uh, opportunity to address all of these issues we have. This work is incredibly rewarding, very hard, but it's also very. Um, it's very exciting because it's so diverse and I'm seeing more and more people over it, over the past 11 years of my career, just an increasing amount of people wanting to do this work, wanting to know how do I become a modern shepherd? shepherd? What does it mean to be a graze, grazier, a grazer with an eye, one who grazes animals? Um, so uh, there essentially are not enough targeted grazing businesses to address the, the thousands, if not millions of acres that need to be uh, managed in our country. So what did we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Goli, you're a little bit choppy there. So I cut you off, keep going. It's okay, all good. So uh, uh, Grazer's Toolbox, there's there's a okay, go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay there, but I can go on this one. So uh, here's this awesome opportunity. Here's all the things that need to get fixed. Here's some folks that are trying to fix them, but, um, but they also have to run businesses, right? And so what is a grazer school box? Through uh, Cole's everyday practice as a grazer and through fiber shed support, we decided to create a, a toolbox of templates and methodologies that everyday grazers can utilize in their efforts. Again, this is like the not so sexy back end, right? And each tool is geared towards anybody at any stage in their, in their business operation. Um, and any type of business, so fire mitigation, integrated crop livestock system, whether you're working on municipal or state land, or county land or private land or with uh, HOAs, um, or if you're just hanging out with your neighbors and grazing their backyard, um, you may not realize it, but you are actually running a little tiny small business. And you may really realize it and need some extra help. So some of the tools we're gonna present today, we're gonna give a quick overview of some of the things that were created. Some of them are, are relevant to just uh, ruminant grazing companies. Some of them are pretty universal. Um, some of them have been aug augmented for full care cattle operations, and, and some of them address meat and fiber sales as well. So today is a little bit of a mashup of the tools that we helped create for this fiber shed project, and also Cole's day-to-day -day tools that she has been utilizing and sharing with folks as well. So that's what we're going to cover, and I am going to dive right in and go first um, with our fiber shed tools. So tomorrow, when you get this, tomorrow all of you will get this presentation or in the next few days, Evan's gonna be pretty busy, but there will be follow-up with uh, the PDF of this presentation and all of the links are live in this presentation so that you have the resources that we're gonna talk about in the end of the day, as well as a PDF of the complete list of tools that we created for Fiber Shed. So just a brief review right now, what those are include a contract grazing agreement, a land use agreement in a lease situation, in a contract situation. That was a partnership with California FarmLink who provided the legal assistance to create something that was solid and binding. Um, there's also full 
suite of business plan templates that are somewhat universal. You can absolutely use those for any kind of business. So those of you that are coming here with just a little bit of curiosity about what grazing is about or want to integrate it as an enterprise into your livestock operation, despite how many multiple out enterprises you're running, those will be useful for you as well. Um, there is a meat yield and margin calculator, which is a very deep dive into what's coming off of every harvest in a record keeping, uh, it's a record keeping tool and then analyzing every breakdown for the amount of meat you actually get back and looking at your cut by cut margin. Um, it's something that we give out as part of the fiber shed toolbox in a simple form. We also have a much more complex form that calculates gross margin and uh, overall business gross margin and looks at how you break out your animals in different sales channels. And I'm excited to say that CAF awarded us uh, one of their small, uh, small farm tech innovation awards this year for that tool. So thanks to CAF for supporting our work there. Um, and then there's also a hiring guide. Oops which is giving you kind of the, the, the full gamut of resources, the soft skills that you need to do good hiring in this field. And it's catered towards hiring for grazing operations, um, including places to post your jobs and job descriptions and how you go about performance reviews and things like that. So th that's what we're not covering today. In addition to those, we also have a herd growth calculator, a contract job break even calculator and a cash flow tool. So those are the three that I'm gonna really quickly breeze through right now. Um, and I'm gonna stop my share and go to a different little cute window. So just bear with me here and my Zoom. All right. Okay, so first one up is our land production and herd growth calculator. So this is a pretty basic tool. For those of you that have been doing uh, livestock growth for a while, you may have stock flow charts, you may have done ranching for profit, you may have um, all sorts of different tools that are, that are either equal or more complex. This one's pretty simple. Um, the idea is to get you started to tracking how you actually create and grow your herd. Whether you're breeding for meat or fiber or contract breeding or not, doesn't matter. In this scenario, you are breeding. Um, and so essentially what we do is you've got your years up on the top. We've got your ewes that are in production at the start of the year. Um, what, who's coming out of production, whether they're, you're culling or you're selling and how many are coming into your outfit. Then we've got your conception rate, your lambing rate, your weaning rate, your predator and sick Sick, sickness loss rates. Those are things that are estimates for you that you would just glean from your own observation of your own outfit. That comes from, you know, a little bit of um, muscle memory over time. Even if you're just making chicken scratch, scratch notes, you can calculate that up into a percentage over time. And if you're curious, like ask your friends, ask your colleagues, take a guess. Um, some of these, you know, numbers in here are actually like industry appropriate estimates, but they might not be your operational numbers. So start uh, noticing that's, a, that's a, all about, you know, this is all about good record keeping. So then we've got, uh, you know, male and female percentage down here, 50, 50 is kind of a safe bet unless you sincerely observe otherwise. And everything in gray is a formula. And so what it populates for you is how many ewes actually got pregnant, how many lambs are born based again on your conception rate and your lambing rate, how many were weaned, and then how many you're gonna keep for your production and how production meaning contract grazing. I'm like, oops, sorry, production is everybody. And then males is how many you're gonna sell to, for meat and, and then the remainder, goes back up to populate your herd and stay in the game to do your grazing, add it on to the use you already had, and the whole thing starts back over. If for some reason you decide not to sell all of your males, which you very well may not, you can just augment that number up here with the, the use 
sold and not in production and, and uh, play with those numbers as to who you actually keep. So super simple um, and hopefully still helps you figure out when you're gonna get to the number you wanna get in a few years based on how many you need to buy in and how many you're losing along the way um, and how many you're losing as well. So next one up is our contract grazing job break even. This one's gotten a lot of traction. Uh, people tend to, to dig it uh, in the industry. And the first tab is a sense of the overall goal is to figure out if you're gonna make money on an individual contract, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we do that? We're going to start with our estimated contract price per acre, which is how you're negotiating usually. Uh, the number of acres in your contract. Again, everything in blue here I'm editing and everything in black is a formula that uh, will populate for you. And that fits you out your total contract amount. Now this is where I'm playing with dollar amounts as I'm negotiating and actually prior to, neg to negotiation where I'm thinking about what I wanna charge for an individual job, right? Number of days on contract, obviously that's also something you would play with and the number of heads on the contract and the number of herders on site. So the reason I populate the number of herders on site is because as you see down here, we're gonna get into what those herders cost me on the job. And I'll get to that in just a second. So the first thing it tells you is your price per head per day that you might then quote to your client, um, which is a number that you may or may not actually utilize. You may utilize just the total contract price, uh, but it's something that's you know it's good to have on hand in case you wanna grow the herd inside of that contract on the same acreage without changing your pricing structure. And then the way that I calculate break even in general in anything in life is I take the money that I'm making in revenue and I put it up against my direct variable costs, the costs that change with the number of head and the number of acres that I might do in that contract in this case. So only the things that are really apply in my business to doing this job. So what are those things? Uh, we can consider those things herder costs. Uh, if there's a specific project manager that's paid just for that job, supplemental feed, minerals, supplies, trucking and freighting or hauling, fuel, fencing specific to that job that you might need to uh, replace or add onto your basic uh, fence supply and any additional dogs. So what we don't include in here are things like vet and your whole basic crew of dogs, which we consider, um, you know, something that's general to your grazing business. But if you have to buy dogs specifically for this contract, you would put them in here. So let's talk about the herder costs real quick. Those are actually a formula. They're powered by this tab over here. And what we do is we calculate what an annual herder's costs are in a single year. Um, everything that you support them. Now, this, this tab is, is constructed for somebody that is, or constructed inspired by somebody that's using H2A labor. It's absolutely applicable to any of you in any situation. It's what your herder costs you in a year. What it does then, and breaks that out uh, on a prorated day-by-day -day basis based on the number of days you have in the contract here, what your herder costs for the entire contract. Um, you could also change this to be monthly costs, for example. That's absolutely fine. You could also overwrite the formula and just put in what you're gonna pay the herder for the job. No big deal. And I usually send this out unlocked so people can, can navigate around it and change it as they wish. Um, we built in a 5% percentage of overage for who's in the frick knows what's going to happen, um, just in case to be conservative. And you've got some lines to add in other direct costs for your job if you need them. Uh, if you need more lines, I'm happy to drop them in for you as well. So then what it tells you is your total cost per contract. Everything it's going to cost you to do the contract. Everything it's going to cost you per acre to do the contract. Everything it's going to cost you per head, per day to do the contract. Again, those are super powerful numbers for what, knowing whether you're gonna make money on a job or not. We're trying to take the guesswork out of that. And down here, you have then your gross profit. So what's that? Your revenue less your cost in dollar amount, in percentage amount, and in per acre, and per head per day. 
So depending on the kind of metric that you want to see and think about for this job, it kind of gives you all of them. So this is a template. We then recommend you build one of these for every style of job you do, you know, and not that you're going that all jobs are going to be the same, but ideally they're not all different with all different prices. Um, because on this cute little tab, what we do is allow you to calculate your break even for your overall business and for the year essentially. So if you can lump your job types into say uh, basic separation by price and style of job. So you see up here running along the top, the columns that I have is um, say a vineyard job at 50 bucks an acre, another vineyard job that's harder at 90 bucks an acre, fire reduction, perennial cropland. So these are, these are totally examples. Uh, you might always charge the same amount of money. You might do every single job individually and that's fine too. You would just make a different template. You would copy over this template and make a different tab for each job and you could calculate each job separately. And you might never use this tab, but what this tab tells you is, okay, of the jobs that I have that I'm gonna charge 50 bucks an hour for, and they all have you know, relatively similar costs based on what I just did on that other tab, I take this cost per acre that it has calculated for me on this page, this $27.30 per acre that it has calculated for me. I drop that in here and the number of acres I'm thinking of selling for the whole year, for the whole season rather. And I do that for all my different kinds of jobs. And then it tells me, all right, well, if that's how you're gonna work, here's your weighted average sale price. Here's, here's your average sale price. What weighted means is it's weighted by the number of acres you do at each price, right? So a simple average would be like, I charge 50 for one job and 100 for another. So my average is 75 bucks an acre. But if I sell a thousand acres at the higher price, my, av my weighted average price is gonna be higher. It tells you your weighted average cost. It's the cost that it takes you to work each acre and your margin. So then down here, and this is where it gets kind of sexy. You drop in the rest of what it takes to run your business for the whole year. Everything that's not a direct cost that goes into the jobs that you're doing. So all these direct costs, take them out. Whatever's left, your car, your salaries for people that are not working individual jobs, your administrative costs, your insurance, all of that, whatever that nut is that we call overhead, you would drop that in here. And then it will actually tell you how many acres you need to sell this year. And it will tell you how many acres you need to sell by type down here. Um, again, you can choose not to use this tab. You can just quote jobs with this other tab and drop in your cost and be on your way. And that would make me super happy if that's all you did. So I know I'm going super fast, but uh, we just wanted to give you a snapshot and we're here so that you can get more uh, explanation and use out of these tools in the future. So I'm gonna skip ahead to the third one real quick, which is our cash flow tool. So this one has a lot of instructions in the front that will help you manage it. And essentially it is a simple cash flow tool, which allows you a place to budget for your whole operation for up to three years and also know what's happened in your bank account at the bottom. So what you'll see here at the top and running all the way down is the categories that match your accounting software's income statement or P&L that it spits out if you're using accounting software. If you're not, these are the categories that ideally you are tracking in your business. This is a little bit of a cheat sheet for how we want you to track things in your business. It's set up for different styles of income. Every single section has places for you to edit. Everything is editable over here on the side, but um, we've set it up already for a contract raising business. Um, and we built this tool for Colt. So I think she can speak to whether it works well or not. Then we have all of our direct costs on all of the jobs and all of the meat that we might sell and all of the fiber that we might sell. And then our operating costs, all of the indirect costs, the ones that don't change as we add more jobs or add more head to our, our flock or our herd or our flirt. Um, 
our overhead, as we like to say. So again, it's subtotaling every category for you. There's lots of room to add your own categories. Um, and then down at the bottom, do, 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 there's a spot to put in the things you wanna buy. One-time capital expenses that are your equipment, your infrastructure, um, your, your breeding stock, everything that is considered an asset in your business, your vehicles. And this allows you to try and time when those purchases can happen a little bit better based on your cash flow. At the bottom here, it all comes together. I'm gonna to skip over to this tab real quick. The financing tab is where you put in either the investment that is coming into the business via outside investors, your own money, random gifts, um, or equity financing that you're going after, your debt that you might seek and be able to have, including the payment terms of each style of debt and royalty financing. All of that is how you fund the business at any given stage. Again, it's not necessarily for startup businesses, but it does help you if you're thinking about it. These numbers funnel into this little section right here, financing. So it sums up the money that's coming in from equity or debt and the money that you have to pay out for those debt payments, those credit card payments, those lines of credit, those friends and family loans. Um, it also sums up everything that we saw up there from operations and any equity that's coming in. And what do you get? Actual cash at the end of the day. And what do you enter down here? The cash you see in your bank account and it self corrects moving forward. So this acts as, uh, like I said, a cash flow budget tool. So you can actually project the whole year, but then adjust as your bank balance really um, changes. And it goes hand in hand with looking backwards at uh, your, ideally your accounting software's p and uh, profit and loss statement, if it's fitting it out and it's balance sheet. Um, otherwise, no worries, get out the box, the receipt and check it out and see what's different about all these things. So with that, I'm going to um, go back to our, oh, sorry, I didn't need to stop share. I'm just gonna go back to our regular presentation and hand the baton over to Ms. Cole to talk about the Shepherdess Land and Livestock tools that she has built and used. Cole, let me see if you, uh, you still got the remote control. Okay, I try just now. got it. Awesome. So, so awesome, Olivia. I work with Olivia uh, quite often and it's been, gosh, I don't know, eight years um, developing uh, a lot of these tools together. And um, as of 2020, uh, I launched Shepherdess Land and Livestock. Last year was our first uh, season um, grazing for good in the Ojai Valley and these tools have been indispensable to the development of my operation. And um, so it's really great just to kind of step back and get an overview, Olivia, with you, because I've been so in it. And it's reminding me of all the things that I have to update <laughs> in, for, in my model right now. Um, I did want it to say that um, I have to emphasize how important it is to have good books and have the right support for books. So along with working with Olivia in the structure and these tools, um, working with a financial advisor and a bookkeeper and accountant who really understands our business is really important. And in tool, I also have to um, say it's very important that your chart of accounts also lines up with uh, that, uh, that tool as well. Um, so I'm gonna jump into tools that uh, our operation are using on the ground. We are new, we're always adapting. Some things don't work, some things do, and every operation is different. So I encourage folks to kind of learn, you know, if you take what you want and then adapt um, and try things out. And maybe you'll have to junk um, some of these tools if, and just, you know, adapt as you go. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the technology that we use. Um, that's part of this ancient futures situation is that we use technology to our benefit, really, really setting the bar for the industry of how we can use um, innovation and technology to support us 
um, moving this type of work into the future. The importance of branding and marketing, and then operations as we're developing, we're seeing the importance of having um, having checklists that are standardized. So as we grow, we're able to grow in an organic way that has structure. And uh, the checklist that I've uh, originally developed over the years were, was based off of my experience on a different type of operation. So now with my own business, having its, its own specific ways of operations, um, we're now looking to update how uh, each of these checklists speaks to how our operation works and how our operation is changing as we grow. So here we get going. The first thing I would like to show you is a whole bunch of screen grabs of uh, tools that we use. All right, I click and oh. there we go. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. So I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna go back just so I can, you can see what the uh, tools are that I'm showing you. Field margin is an, is an application that was developed in the UK for um, farm project management. And we have adapted it to work for our uh, contract grazing operation. Um, it, in, it helps us to um, map our projects, record what, uh, our actions on a particular project, as well as supporting communications, how we quote projects, project management. And I will go on to Unhunt X and Apple Tools um, further on. So this is just a screen grab of the app. It's both on, uh, you can throw it up on your computer and on your uh, your whole team you're able to communicate and do uh you're able to communicate through an activities uh let's see where you go the the little dude with the hat uh oh Olivia you pushed me on it's okay so you're able to communicate through uh drop points we're we good 10 minutes okay uh we're able to communicate with drop points have acreage for each paddock or location. Um, on the left, you can see our ranch. Um, drop points can include water points, uh, where we drop our, our trailer for specific jobs. We can look at, uh, for the green for the green on, uh, on the left-hand side, those are potentials when we're thinking what kinds of projects, um, what kinds of uh, acreage are we looking at for potential projects or potential acreage. There, uh, we had paddocks um, built on our home ranch, and there's a cool function where you, the herder can walk the, the lines of exactly where uh, they built that fence. And so this is an actual documentation of where we built fences last year. Um, let's see if I can move forward. Arrow. Can you advance me? There you go. That's our home ranch. And that yellow line is actually a, a pathway that we're working. To, it's a kind of a dream pathway for us to go across um, a, a full, a full uh, series of private lands to actually land at one of our, our uh, contracts that we have annually. Again, this is one of the paddock uh, made You. You're breaking up a little bit, Cole. There's a delay the on slide board. Yeah, yeah. Do the slide. How's that? Okay. There you go. This is an example of one of the activity drop points where we can say we can speak to one another. We can oh, do. It's okay. <laughs> we can take photographs of a specific thing that we want to look at. This one in particular is. We nailed this. Uh, we nailed this uh, elderberry, and we want to see what it's going to do this spring. And so I dropped a point. I I made a little note, and uh, I can tag people to go out and check it, perhaps this year, and then we can have a discussion to see how our impact um, is from year to year. Next slide. 
So another tool that we it was developed for hunters, um, and a lot of these folks need to know property lines, lots of different data points, and uh, so we modified it to help us understand using county information, uh, California private lands and government lands, and those gray areas that you see, uh, the gray lines, let's see, I think the next slide I get closer in, you can actually click these property lines and it, it pulls up the information of each, uh, of each property owner. So actually helps us to um, locate, you know, uh, how to find our neighbors and also if we need access to one of these um, an easement or something like that we actually know who the taxpayer is and how to potentially locate them to communicate um, another cool thing about this is the map layers that can give us information that is available um, such as drought data historic wildfires that have come into certain areas that might uh, tell us something about the succession of the type of vegetation in a region, and then slope and angle. These are all cool tools um, that we still have yet to, to really dig in and use, but primarily we use them for uh, property lines. So when we, do, uh, when we do quotes and bids, we make sure that we're doing so um, in, in such a way we're not building fences on neighbors' uh, properties. Next. Also, our phones have so many cool built-in tools that are um, uh, super simple and free because they just, they just are there. We use, um, this is a screen grab of, uh, the cool thing about reminders is that uh, you can share it with your team. So your team can all see all of these checklists. And team members can go ahead, open it up, see what uh, is on that checklist, and then go ahead and if they want to take care of it, they do, and they check it off. And we can, it's a way that we're all on the same page uh, on tasks. And we have this for all kinds of projects. Um, I have one personally, the team has one, our project management team has one. These are really, really cool tools. Google also has uh, these types of tools. Integration, when you have a team with different uh, systems, gets challenging, but there are workarounds. Next slide. The importance of branding and marketing, I cannot stress any, you know, I can't stress enough. It, because we are essentially living public the public. We need to understand how to help us help them. And branding and marketing can really help do that and set the bar of not just taking goats and sheep as a, a novel cute thing on hillsides, but really see how these, uh, what we're doing is an impactful and, and can be uh, to scale um, a, a management tool that can, and that can, you know, essentially save towns. So I wanted to share with you um, Canva, which is a very easy, um, uh, a very easy tool to use for building your signage, um, for your websites, for your social media, things like that. It's an easy tool. If you're not a designer, it's okay. It's a, a lot of it is just plug and play. I work with Farm Run, which is a uh, creative studio specific to agricultural businesses. He's one of my best of friends, Andrew Plotsky. And there's beginning of your operation before you get into business or even if you are in business go through the process of really doing the creating the the, the the solid foundation not just your business plan but how you want to visually speak to the world signage is an incredibly important piece in helping the public help us do our jobs and then marketing potentials are everywhere um, when your animals are out um, on not out of fence <laughs> out in the world. <laughs> all right you can uh bump it to the next one where am i on time doing great okay cool so um i just minutes. wanted to okay i just wanted Project. to show you good i am usually long-winded so thank you olivia i uh want to show you 
uh, some screen grabs of what we call, what, it, what was this called? Um, well, the brand style guide. guide. Yeah, 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 style guide, yeah, style guide. Oh, there it is. Um, I went through this process and this iterative process with Andrew Farmrun to go through the foundation of the visual language of my business. We created the logo after some iterations. We created secondary icons that we can use in social media, but then also in, in other print materials, um, any presentations. Um, I use all of this stuff to create continuity for my brand. We got, we got standard colors and fonts, so we don't spend all this crazy amount of time trying to figure out how to make our stuff look pretty when we're even when we're doing invoicing or, or quotes or bids or whatnot. Next. This is a screen grab from the uh, from Canva and you can see that Canva all kinds of uh, print and marketing materials. I use this all the time in, in, in so many different context and the way that I can make it really easy, next slide, to plug and play is that you can upload all of that branding material that you developed with your designer. So upload it in Canva. I have all of my fonts. I have all of my logo files. I have, uh, I have all the images that I like to use for, for my marketing materials. And all I simply do is drag and drop to fit any any dimension or context. Next. Again, here is, um, I love our signage. <laughs> the hardest thing with signage is trying to find the right material and how to get it into the ground and where, and where you put it. But I have to say it is incredibly important. So whatever shepherd is on deck is holding a phone um, with a specific phone number just for that position. And so if any crazy thing happens when we're out in the public, we try to have these signs out there. So uh, I don't get the call <laughs> first. The shepherds directly get that call and they can address the issue right then and there. Um, I've also used, um, uh, I've also created brochures that I can share with neighbors and share. Uh, I, I've been sharing this digitally often. So think about when you do print material to make sure that also it works really well digitally as well or vice versa. You make something digital, make sure it prints well. Um, and we really haven't had to market very hard because the animals do a lot of work already. How we uh, how to uh, stable back again? Q haven't really figured that out. Oh, thank you. Um, but it does. Uh, I think it will work in time. But uh, you have to make sure it's it's actually kind of expensive to have a QR code, but it will take people straight to your web or uh, or you can direct it pretty much anywhere. So um, I think it will be a cool thing the more and more we're in public park. Uh, but uh, we haven't really next. Cole, you're breaking up a bit. I don't oh. know if you want to try hitting off your video just for finishing your slides, maybe. Yeah. Oh, sure. Let's okay. Try that. Great. I'm almost done. So standardizing operations as we're organically and rapidly growing, we're seeing the uh, the importance of having these these uh, uh, what what we essentially call them our checklists. Safety checklist of what what are the things that we need to check when we're loading animals and before we drive off. Same thing when we get off of a trailer. What are the things that we need to do? Not just getting the animals in the fence line where they're working next, but what do we have to do to clean up shop? Uh, clean the back of the trailer. Um, make sure that we have our hitches and pins. All kinds of things. These checklists. Um, as our team grows, and also for general safety, 
these checklists are, are, are very important. Inventory checklist. You start spending a lot of money when you lose a whole bunch of stuff and you have to repair a lot of stuff. And I'm finding that as we grow with each herd that we will have, having a standardized checklist um, that we can check, uh, that we can start with and at the end of the season, see what we've lost or even mid-season or periodically will help us to understand how much does it cost us in repairs um, or losses uh, every or in different increments of the season um, uh, to replace things. And also just to ge general organization when we have a lot of people uh, on jobs. Best practices and to-do lists I can't emphasize any more the importance of training folks to do things the same way uh, because it can get very complicated when you have a big team um, and, and folks coming and going. And so again, as my business grows, working with my head chef, I think he's on here, shout out Dylan, uh, standardizing these these things so as we grow, we can train um, and, and maintain the tightness that we wanna see in our businesses, in our operations. Next. Here we go, Whoa, and how do we get we go. cool? <laughs> cool, those are awesome. Thank you so much for showing on all of that stuff. I hope everybody, there's a little choppy in there, but please ask questions in the chat. We forgot to say that in the beginning after all these webinars we've been doing for two years. Throw your questions in the chat. We're gonna get to them in just a couple minutes. So you're all saying, awesome, but how do I get these tools? Um, so for those of you that are in Northern California and you are a grazing operation or you are uh, somebody that's working with a fiber block or a meat block, but doing contract grazing, Think about applying to Fibershed as a producer. Check out the link here, check out fibershed.org, see if you are eligible, um, you most likely are, if you're one of the things I just said, and you will receive all the tools for free alongside access to a suite, a full business curriculum that we developed over the course of three years of something like 20 different courses for running your business that goes super deep on all things. Um, in addition to the Grazer's Toolbox, we offer a couple of hours of technical assistance, one-on-one -on -one individualized learning for any of the tools you're interested in. And there's some group learning sessions coming up. You're not in Northern California, that's okay. Get in touch with me directly. Um, these tools are available for use in licensing and we keep the prices low. We know what your business reality is. Um, and I always set it up with some kind of training too, so I can hold your hand at the, the, the outset. Um, Cole is available as well, Cole, for the same thing. Obviously some of these tools that she's pointed out are online and are free. So that's why we're here today, to encourage you to go get them. And um, we're happy to give out our emails and we'll drop them in the chat. They're at the end of the presentation. We're here to answer your questions and we're gonna give a discount for anybody that comes to us for these tools through the CAF uh, by mentioning this presentation and just in case you're not eligible for any of these other things. Can I um, jump love, in? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yes. So a lot oh, of the, it's okay. A lot of the tools that I shared with you are tools that are accessible, but what I would like to offer is the is is a sit down session um, to talk with different individuals looking to start businesses or who are in businesses to go through these different segments of of operations and to share with you a little bit more deeply and train you on how we use these things. Um, uh, timing is a very important piece, of course, for us grazers. So we can discuss that. But that's uh, something I. I would like to offer um, all you calf folks and, and um, new grazers as well is really how did I create the foundation of this business and how can you create a foundation of a business that is setting the bar for this next um, era of targeted grazing. And just a little, you know, shout out to Cole. You know, I am, I'm an individual that works as an educator and gets paid by all kinds of different people to teach what I do. And 
she is somebody running her own private business who has put education front and center at that business. And not everybody needs to or does do that. And it's a different model. And so we're here to have you take advantage of that sort of openness and that level of commitment to community that um, that we both have. But I just want to point out that 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 there's a lot of reason to not fit inside of our fear of competition. And she's a great example of that. So take advantage of it. Um, we'd also love to hear in the chat right now what you'd like to see us develop in the future. We have runways for doing it, continuing to do this, which is awesome. We would love to know what you would like to use and see. Um, drop it in the chat, drop us an email um, as you're sitting here thinking about what you need and what we could potentially provide you with. Um, so just a quick slide on some additional resources. Again, you're going to get this tomorrow in the PDF form, but meaningful industry organizations and some resources. Cool. Did you want to say anything about these? I mean, I think they're somewhat self-explanatory, so you can go check them out. We just wanted to leave you with some, you know, outside resources. Yeah. Yes, there are going to be uh, all hyperlinks, I hope, because I created yeah, that. To, yeah. Uh, I threw out a lot of great stuff in here. What I have to say is visit it and participate, participate, go to conferences, meet people, meet people who have different types of operations, different scales. The UC has an extraordinary community um, of extension agents and of, uh, of educators, and they're there to help us use them, use the tools that are out there, know what's, know what's available to support uh, folks like us. FarmLink is a wonderful resource. All of these are, are organizations that are really working to uplift and support the industry of targeted grazing and general uh, management of our landscapes. Um, and if you are a grazer in business, I say get on match.graze uh, right away because it's an, a really important uh, place for uh, grazers to be found. And we need to continue to populate match.graze. So I encourage you to, to sign up to that. Um, I could keep on talking about media and resources, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I think y'all, again, feel free to reach out. Um, so here's some more. These are some of the other projects that I have been involved with building other tools. I already mentioned the, the yield and margin calculator. For those of you that are working in the West, a um, bunch of other business resources as part of the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. Um, tribal producers, upcoming, look out for tribal livestock producers, look out for some online curriculum coming on in the end of this year that we're developing with the Intertribal Ag Council. We, I keep saying we, it's me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> me with lots of collaborators and partners like that. And some more local stuff. So with that, we wanna get to Q&A. Uh, we would like to take, let's see, what time is it? It's almost five up. We'd like to take 10 minutes for Q&A and, and then take 10 minutes for breakout, group, breakout rooms. I really feel strongly about everybody getting together to talk to other humans in these conference settings. Um, and we'll give you a couple of prompts, but that way you'll get to meet somebody that you would have met if this was in person, maybe. Um, and, but for now, Hit us up with questions. We're gonna take 10 minutes unless it's super interesting and we'll keep going for longer than 10 minutes. But uh, now's your chance. You can holler out, you can type it into the chat. You can send us a little emoticon, whatever makes you comfortable. We'd love to see you on the video. Don't be shy. No questions are dumb. Go. Um, I see some other folks in the room, just real quick. I see some other colleagues in the room. Please also feel free to offer resources in the chat. Those of you who work in grazing, you know who you are, anything you're thinking about, please add it to this wonderful forum. Okay, go ahead, whoever that was that was speaking. Tell us who you are and... Nope, I'm lost there. Gosh, what a quiet group on a Sunday morning. Ah, oh gosh, that will take me 
okay, so the question was, uh, uh, what led me or inspired me to start my business? Oh gosh, um, I'm just gonna answer that quickly. I, uh, I found a meaningful path that I feel is a part of, you know, is my life journey and not just impacting land um, and acres, you know, doing my part in, in this lifetime to bring good. I want to support pathways for other people to do it. And I felt that it was through a for-profit business and testing a model that I would be able to, um, to, to see proof of concept um, that a, uh, someone of, of my background who doesn't come from ag, who comes from agro uh, agroecology background could, um, could start a business and grow a business and create jobs and help others find um, their their journey um, of, of meaningful work in this world. So it's kind of, you know, it's very qualitative. Um, my heart, my heart's in it. Oh, looks like Stephanie Larson raised her hand. Thank you. Well, just, just to add on to that, Cole, real quick, there's one other question before we go to Stephanie. What was your beginning headcount when you started? Just while you're still on your I built startup. um I built over the course of three months. It was basically a hundred goats. Uh, I started with weathers, did not want to breed first year. And then I started with uh, another hundred sheep. Uh, and then I had about 300 for several months and then destocked and for various reasons, but now I have 200 head. Cool, thank you. All right, go Stephanie. Good morning, ladies. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very informative. I have a question that has come up in Sonoma County. Do you guys have a grazing protocol? So if somebody from the public asked, you know, how do you determine the number of animals, you know, uh, water needs, different things like that on how you not necessarily assess a job, but how do you document that at, from an animal welfare perspective? Do you have a protocol for that? From an, an, an animal welfare protocol, well, we use, we use what we share with the public very similar to how we uh, assess a job. So that's the type of animals that we're going to use, sheep or goats or both. How many is based off of how big the contract is, the type of vegetation, what the goals are. Um, we have a, a general, uh, uh, metri general metrics for water, how much water the animals drink. Mm -hmm. And that's anywhere, depending on time of year, a half gallon to two gallons a day. So we need to make sure that we have an adequate um, uh, tank size for the needs of those animals. And also we're looking at how targeted grazing can um, be uh, integrated into the uh, animal welfare approved program. It's, it's a little, it's a little tricky because of the nature of our business, but I think that it's more and more important for uh, the public to under, to the public to know that we are, are, are setting a bar and we are um, maintaining our commitment to taking care of our animals. Okay. Can I, can I follow up on that? I hadn't thought about that. So are you looking to get like a humane um, certification? Yes, yes. Oh, and I, would, okay. I would like to see that specific okay. for contract grazers. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, we're getting some pushback from public that are saying that you know the, the goats don't have enough water, the goats don't have this, the goats don't and, and it's they they do. They the public just doesn't understand those requirements that they don't need six gallons of water per day given the time of the year it is and the, the water right. and the, the forage they're eating yeah. and and different things like that. But I, I like that idea. I will follow up with that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think there's a future where we will have recorded PSAs. I'm pushing it really hard with the Society of Range Management and ASI to create like silly but useful public service announcements that can be dropped into community. Um, uh, either it could be either radio or or local television. I think that needs to be done because, uh, or even little social media clips, because the the public needs to know how this works, why it works, and just general information needs to be shared. And it shouldn't just be the contract grazer who's responsible for that education. My guess also, Stephanie, real quick, is it wouldn't be that challenging to just 
hit up a top, like create a short list of criteria that, that folks are asking you about and then create some model guidelines for, for meeting those, those questions with answers. So water would be one, uh, handling and loading would be another, probably vaccination, you know, and if you could come up with say, like, what are those 10 points that people are asking about, whether they're knowledgeable questions or not, and then hit up the grazing community to say, let's, let's shoot for the median or say, oh, can you fill this out? You know, that could be a way to mitigate um, and almost like creating your own standards for welfare in the industry. And, you know, just, that's just kind of like my off the cuff thought. Um, there's another question in the chat that says, can you tell us a little bit about Shepherdess Land and Livestock and what types of contracts were powering your business in its initial stages? Great question. So something unique about uh, my business is that we are in a really incredible community in the Ojai Valley in Ventura uh, County, Southern California. Um, it was impacted greatly by the Thomas fire in 2017-18 and uh, the community has really rallied together to figure out how to become more fire safe, fire uh, ready. And the local fire safe council in, in conjunction with my operation has um, begun the development of what we're calling the community supported grazing program, really working to stitch together as, met, as many private and public land owners and managers um, together to create a defensible state space corridor around our valley. So a lot of my first contracts were actually um, the first participants and community stakeholders who signed on to participating in the community supported grazing program. This included um, uh, actually a couple of private schools, uh, large private schools that had a lot of uh, have a lot of acreage and then a, a few private foundations, and then also uh, the local fire department, Ventura County Fire Department also supported us and the local RCD. And so we actually were able, the Fire Safe Cam Council was able to find um, uh, funding to support the pilot year. And that was, uh, that funneled in a, a lot to my first year's contracts. A lot of loss leader projects were done in year one, but I have to say it was absolutely um, very beneficial be just for the, the, the public awareness uh, opportunities to get in front of some of the most populated areas in the Ojai Valley. That was because of the community supported grazing program, which we are trying, we're working on developing a transferable framework for other communities to adopt um, the model of the community supported grazing program so we can have region, regionalized solutions um, that other communities can kind of learn from our process in developing this. And uh, we need contract grazers, targeted grazers who share similar values and ethics in, in how we operate to um, answer to this incredible demand. So um, community supported grazing program, that is, um, I would say, a very large Cool. We lost you there at the end, Cole, but no, we are, you're back. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anna, keep going. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much for the answer. So I am a family farmer in Southern California and I don't graze, but I joined this session because we are interested in using grazers and ruminants for kind of crop rotation, et cetera, et cetera, in the community and the ecosystem of our farm. But I was really curious about, man, what kind of people are using contract grazers and this whole community supported grazing, working with the fire department is something I had never really thought about before. Do you still find that now, you know, past pilot year, past year one, a lot of your contracts are still coming from that community supported grazing space or are you finding now different kind of private groups wanting to use your services? Everybody wants our services. <laughs> Great, okay. Okay, so not just kind of fire or community management, you're seeing a more diverse group of consumers now? Absolutely. Uh, from public agencies, private landowners, land conservancies, uh, all, all kinds of vineyards and orchards uh, in different parts of 
the the state you'll see you'll see uh, different types of projects like this. So it's kind of everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Anna.